Hey everyone, welcome back to Wicked Deeds. We're your hosts, I'm Brittany. And I'm John. And today, we'll be covering a case where a reserved young girl vanished on her morning walk to school, and due to the lack of procedure in place at the time, her disappearance went unnoticed for hours. Starting out behind the eight ball, police would need to use every investigative tactic at their disposal if they were to have any chance at finding her. Today's case is about the disappearance of Tammy Belanger. On Tuesday, November 13, 1984, eight-year-old Tammy Belanger walked her normal route to the Lincoln Street School in Exeter, New Hampshire. The school was located less than a mile from her home, and this was her regular daily routine. Kids who lived less than two miles away from school back then all walked there rather than riding the bus or getting driven in. However, that morning, Tammy never made it to school. But unfortunately, no one at least no one who could do anything about it, was made aware of her absence. You see, things are different today when it comes to procedures in most schools, and they're different for a reason. Back in New Hampshire in 1984, and most likely other parts of the country, it wasn't commonplace for schools to alert parents when their child didn't make it to their classes that day. And then on the other hand, parents didn't have to report if their child wasn't going to be at school either. Now knowing how things are today, This just feels like something that could have been avoided. But due to the lack of procedure in place, Tammy's parents never knew of their daughter's absence from school and had no idea that they should be concerned, until later on that afternoon when she didn't return home. Her parents, Patricia and Nelson, were worried and called police right away. Authorities moved quickly when it came to the initial investigation, and they began gathering individuals to assist in grid searches to look for the missing 8-year-old. In an article with Foster's Daily Democrat, there's a passage regarding the steps taken by the lead detective on the case back in 84, Jim Valiquet, and the team he assembled to search for Tammy. It stated, quote, Valiquet, an Exeter native, said he was assigned a search team by 4 or 5 p.m. that November 13th, and together they conducted full grid search patterns beginning at the Belanger house and would examine two or three blocks at a time, painstakingly working their way toward the school. Over the course of the ensuing week, he said police seized the entire street's worth of trash and combed through it at the town's highway department, end quote. Well, one good thing we can start off with, obviously, not that she's missing, but seems like investigators were on the ball. Yes, absolutely. They were all over this from the start. Authorities weren't cutting any corners in terms of their investigation, especially because by the time the young girl had been reported missing, it had already been roughly eight hours since she was last seen. Now, when she was last seen, it was when she was walking along Lincoln Street and then seen crossing Court Street in Exeter as she was making her way towards the school. Even though this was the last sighting of Tammy, I don't believe that anyone who had seen her had even noticed anything out of the ordinary. Yeah, I mean, what's there to see out of the ordinary is just this girl walking to school. Well, she's... You're saying that they didn't see anybody pick her up, they didn't see anybody with her, things like that. exactly. Mm Mm-hmm. It's reported on the Charlie Project's website that she was last seen wearing the following, quote, a purple sweater, an aqua jersey with thin black and white stripes, a short tan jacket with blue sleeves, tan corduroy pants, tan suede boots, and green and blue socks, end quote. It's also been reported that Why she Why did was, you smirk at me like that? <laughs> just because I think it's a wild outfit. <laughs> it is a pretty wild outfit. But it's the 80s, so it makes sense. A lot of tan suede. And a lot of green and blue. Yeah. And stripes and aqua and then a purple sweater. <laughs> it's a she lot of She probably dressed herself. Yeah. It's also been reported that she was carrying her backpack. Obviously, since she was heading to school, that makes sense. The backpack was red and had her name and address on it. Tammy also had a very distinguishing feature about her. She had a lazy eye, and based on photos, it appears as though it's her left eye that's affected. In terms of Tammy's personality, she's been described as a quiet and introverted young girl, so this seemed completely out of the ordinary for her. She wouldn't just skip school or not come home afterwards. Something had to have happened to her. At the time, the residents of Exeter, New Hampshire, were on edge with this news of Tammy's disappearance, 
and it's been stated that the entire scenario instilled a sense of fear within the community. Detectives working the case still hadn't found any sign of the missing girl within the first few days of searching for her, but that certainly didn't stop them from trying. Not only was the Exeter Police Department involved, but there were multiple additional agencies assisting in the investigation, including Manchester PD, the state police, and the FBI. So in a lot of these cases, we talk about like the place where it occurred, the town, the city, whatever. Mm -hmm. You said that a lot of the residents were on edge now. Is this a smaller, you know, tight-knit community like some of the other cases we've talked about, or is it a bigger city? So since Niche.com is my favorite website to look up, towns on and they're great and all that but on here it says it's like a dense suburban feel so I kind of envision then like a tight-knit community everyone's probably really close together like all the houses people probably don't have like a crazy ton of land it's probably not super rural so it's not like everybody knew everybody but everyone knew their neighbor probably yeah I mean it's 15,000 residents as of today so as long as it's suburbia mm. People are going to be on edge when an eight-year-old goes missing. Yes, exactly. On top of the additional manpower, authorities didn't spare any of the investigative tools at their disposal. We know that they had searched through all of the trash belonging to those living or working on the street Tammy was last seen on, but investigators also went as far as to even drain local rivers to try and find any sign of her. On top of that, the Foster's Daily Democrat reported on additional efforts that Jim Valiquet and his team had used in their attempts to find Tammy. He stated, quote, We were opening manhole covers. We were searching in dumpsters, knocking on doors, interviewing people along her normal path. I think we didn't spare any opportunity we had to get some real investigative talent in here, end quote. But unfortunately, even with the extent authorities went to to try and find Tammy, all of their efforts came up empty. It's terrible to hear stories like this. Obviously, you don't want to hear any type of tragedy where somebody dies or somebody's missing, mm -hmm. stuff like that, but... It is always refreshing to hear when an agency, especially in 84, mm -hmm. is like, sparing no expense, we are fucking doing everything. I mean, first off, going through trash yep. is huge. Taking every single ounce of trash from that street, sifting through it at like the local highway department, I think is mm -hmm. what they said. The While amount of time that right, takes. Right. While they're doing grid searches mm -hmm. all the way to the school. Literally that night, they gathered as many people as they could step by step by step all the way from her house, which obviously we know was under two miles away. I don't know exactly where their house was in proximity to the school, but you have to assume it's at least two miles or under. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of effort. That's a lot of effort. And then they're draining rivers. Yeah. Not to go on a tangent about it, but you got to give credit where credit's due sometimes because if every case had this type of attention mm -hmm. and this type of effort put into it, we would have a lot less tragedy to talk about. I think Sharon Thor is the perfect example of that where they didn't find her body for a couple days after they waited to see if she'd come home. And, and it's she only a few right miles from the house, yeah, not even. she's right nearby. Like, if you had done that that night, what kind of evidence could you have found? Like, what other things could, could have Could you have stopped it from that? happening? Exactly. Could you have interrupted whatever happened? So mm -hmm. just seeing that, like you've said before in previous episodes, what is the worst case scenario? Right. You find them, mm -hmm. and they're I mean, it's your friggin' job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... I know times were different back then, and I mean, even with the school portion of it, right? I was in elementary school in the 90s, mm -hmm. less than a decade later, and if I wasn't at school, you know, they were calling on my parents, or mm -hmm. if I was going to be out sick, you know, my parents had to call in, tell them that I wasn't going to be there, because yep. they wanted to know, and it was mm -hmm. weird if somebody didn't show up. I mean, even think about it as a teacher, though. Yeah. If you were a teacher in 84, and all of a sudden, like, this girl that's always there is not there, wouldn't you be like, hmm, that's I wonder weird. where she's at? Yeah. Yeah. That's it's definitely strange. something to think about, but- it's one of those things where as much as this is horrible, what's happening, at least you've learned from a mistake. It's the worst case scenario type of mistake to make. Right. But hopefully nothing like that would ever happen again because you have these procedures in place to hopefully avoid it. Right. With the initial days of the investigation being unsuccessful, authorities went on to work with the psychic, which would hopefully lead them to Tammy's whereabouts. Call me now. <laughs> <laughs> These freaking psychics, man. I know. But you have to think, it is 84. Yeah. Maybe people were more... Um, accepting or... Less skeptical. Yeah. And I think it's just like there's so many older cases that we cover that... Have this aspect attached to it. Yeah. And I think it's predictable. You expect it with these cases. So I guess my only defense in this case 
they have done pretty much everything I think you should do mm -hmm. from like a normal investigative aspect now. Well, think about it. This is within days. But look at all the shit that they did in those days. Yeah. So if they're like, okay, we got nothing. Let's We're not just... going to waste any time. We're not going to wait a month yeah. because if this girl is in a ditch somewhere mm -hmm. and we can bring them in now because all of the work that we just did turned up nothing and they did a lot of fucking work. Yeah. Let's bring it in now instead of waiting. Okay. So, so... I, I'm okay with them doing that because and only because mm -hmm. of all the actual good police work they've done so far. Rather than like, oh, we did like a quick cursory search and we're just going to do this because we feel like it and, and it's the cool thing to do or something, you know? Right. And it kind of makes me sound like a hypocrite because in Debbie Makel, like when she was missing, mm -hmm. they went and they went to the football stadium and like had hundreds of people or yeah. a ton of people looking for it right off the bat. And they kind of had that same thing happen where they brought in the psychic. Yes. So maybe I'm a hypocrite in that respect. Like, I'm okay with some people doing it, but not okay with others. It doesn't mean that I believe what the psychic is going to say is going to be useful. Yeah. But I understand their thought here. Yeah. No, I totally get what you're saying. So there's a passage in that same Foster's Daily Democrat article I mentioned earlier that described how this psychic, who was named Whitney Boyd, got involved. The passage stated, quote, Boyd said she was driving along Route 101 mid-morning the day Belanger went missing and claimed she had a vision of the missing girl pass across her windshield, and she asked Boyd to help her find her dead body, end quote. That's fucking weird. Yes, yeah, so I'm understanding that to mean that Tammy asked this psychic to help her find her body. Is that how you're interpreting that? I'm interpreting that as well, or to help police find her. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like Tammy asking. That's the vision she had. Yes, I get that, and... Maybe if I had some semblance of these type of powers, I would believe that. Well, I want to read some more of this quote to you. There's more to it. This article goes on to state, quote, Boyd claimed, without any supporting evidence, Belanger's remains, after being incinerated, were disposed of near a small neighborhood in Dover she said was not searched by investigators. Law enforcement officials interviewed for this story declined to comment on specific locations where they searched for possible human remains, end quote. I mean, I would decline to comment, too. That I understand fully. I think if you're a psychic and you have any credibility, it's ballsy to come forward with that because if it turns out to be totally false and she had no information on it and it's like, mm -hmm. there's nothing there. Yeah. You're losing credibility in people that may want to use your services down the line. I understand that. Yeah. I think it's also the way this article's written where it chimes in with the... She claimed this without any supporting evidence. Well, it sounds like whoever wrote that article is a skeptic, too. Yes, exactly. So that had me giggling a little when I was first writing this down. I was like, <laughs> I got to add this quote in here. You'll get a kick out of it. Right. They're like, this crazy lady said that this happened. <laughs> yeah, in nicer terms. But there's no way it did. And police don't want to even talk about it. Yes, exactly. So. And obviously, I think we can already tell none of the psychic's information was helpful. And it didn't further police's investigation at all. One thing I, I want to say, though, is think about being those cops. Say you're like me mm -hmm. and you're like, I don't believe psychics. And then they're like, <laughs> yeah. oh, we just got this tip and you got to go check this out and blah, 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 blah. And you yep. got to go Dover and look for all this stuff and it ends up coming up with nothing. But you got to do your due diligence and look at it. Yep. Because this girl was gone for eight hours. Mm -hmm. She could have been missing for up to eight hours before anybody knew anything. Exactly. So, so how you far could, could she have gone? You could have drove to Canada by then from New Hampshire. Yes, Absolutely. You can't rule it out just because Dover's maybe like an hour away or two mm -hmm. hours. I don't know the distance, but unfortunately, you got to you gotta look at it. It makes sense. It probably just sucks after the fact. You're like, ugh, not like what a waste of time, but I bet in that moment, it's like, yeah. oh, this feels like a waste of time. We could be doing other things to try and find her yeah. where this didn't pan out. But I get what you're saying. It is totally necessary. Right. Now, during my research on this case, I had seen it reported in an article with the Brattleboro Reformer that the chief of police at the time stated, quote, all of the information that has been received has been followed up on and exhausted, end quote. So this is Exeter Police Chief? Correct. Okay. So just based on that, it seemed as though there was nothing else to go on. No tips or leads, at least not credible ones, and not one single sign to point authorities in any direction. That is, until I found information regarding a suspect that had landed smack dab into investigators' laps from the very beginning. From what I've gathered, it appears as though this individual wasn't discussed in local media until later, and that's why I hadn't been able to find any information at first. But once I dug deeper, 
and started to uncover some intriguing connections, it became apparent that police may have found their guy from the very start. Very start like, how very start? (laughs) We'll get there. Okay. This man's name was Victor Winetti Jr., and his sordid past is just one of the reasons it seems as though he may be the one responsible for Tammy's disappearance. I'm going to back up a little bit and give you a brief history on Victor, where he lived and worked, the things he got himself into, and a lot of the details in between. So we'll start back in 1973, over a decade prior to Tammy's disappearance. All the stuff that you're going to go over is stuff prior to 84. At this point, yes. So you'll know each year of whatever it is that I'm talking about. All right. So back in 1973, Victor Winetti was living in New Hampshire and was charged with the molestation of an eight-year-old girl. Based on my sources, it appears as though Victor was friendly with this young girl's mother. However, charges were later dropped against him in this molestation case the following year in 1974. And then later on that same year, Victor actually goes on to marry this eight-year-old girl's mother. That's fucked up. Especially if this mother chose to put herself before her child and that shit really happened. So there was actually a really in-depth article done on Victor and his past and all of that. And there's this passage here that leads me to like the reason why these charges may have dropped. I'll read it to you. It says, quote, The girl couldn't distinguish between fact and fantasy, Winetti's lawyer said. And the girl's mother didn't believe her either. The state dropped the case in January of 1974, and Winetti married the girl's mother five months later, end quote. So I have seen too many times, and I have heard too many times, Mm -hmm. where a parent might not have their best interest for their child. And of course Winetti's fucking lawyer is going to say that. Of course he is. All he's worried about is getting his client off. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Me personally... If I had a child and they came forward and they said that a family friend did something to them. You're going to believe your kid first. I'm going to believe my kid and put them first over a friendship with someone or a potential relationship with someone. Yeah. Like think about how many times you have like a boyfriend or an uncle or something like that that sexually assaults a child. And Mm -hmm. because it's family, it gets covered up and the kid has to fucking live with it all this time. But clearly this guy was a bad dude. Yes. Whatever happened with him and... This girl's mother, it's a side piece to the story that we're talking about today, but it goes without saying that too many times do adults put themselves ahead of their children and the children are the ones to suffer for it. Agreed. Fast forward five years to 1979. This girl is 13 years old and still living with her mother and alleged abuser, her now stepfather. At some point during this time, those claims from 1973 manifest into verifiable actions when Victor was caught this time by his wife molesting their daughter. Victor would be charged again and was convicted this time and sentenced to seven and a half to 15 years in prison. But due to good behavior, Mr. Winetti was able to get out of prison far earlier after serving only four years of that sentence. So now it's 1983 and Victor is out of prison. And a little while later, in March of 1984, He moved down to Florida to live with his mother in the Lake Worth area. Someone only a mother could love. For real. And no shit, he had good behavior. He had no fucking kids in prison. They were all adults. (laughs) Fuck. (laughs) You shouldn't, child molesters should not get good behavior. No, absolutely not. They should be charged and whatever their sentence is, that's what they fucking stay in there for. I agree. Because you think about it, it's like, not only are they taking advantage of people, they're taking advantage of children and Mm -hmm. adolescents, like people that can't really defend themselves or that are easily impressionable and shit. And it pisses me off even more now knowing that if he was caught red-handed this time, it definitely happened when she was eight years old. Yep. So how many times did it happen between 1973, 1974 when the charges were dropped, and now 1979, five years later? Based on the way this article's written, it seems like a lot. And it seems like there was some sort of relationship there. So it's just really fucked up. And as much as it sucks that he didn't fulfill his entire sentence, at least he got put away that time. Yeah, a little bit. Should have gotten worse, though. Agreed. Now, when Victor was living in Lake Worth with his mother, he was working for a golf course in the Wellington, Florida area. And while he was spending time in this area, a young girl goes missing. Now, mind you, at this point in Victor's timeline of events, it's six months prior to when Tammy disappears. But this story is important, and there are some big connections to Victor and, later on, to Tammy's case. 
So I'll give you a quick rundown. What? Why are you shaking your head? I'm shaking my head because I fucking hate this guy. <laughs> I think everybody fucking hates this guy. So just wait. Okay. So Marjorie Christina Luna, also known as Christy, which is what I'm going to refer to her as as we move forward in the story, was an eight-year-old girl who went missing from Greenacres, Florida on Memorial Day weekend in 1984. It was Sunday, May 27th, and Christy had just told her mother that she was going to hop on over to the local Greenacres grocery store to pick up some cat food. This interaction with her mother took place sometime around 3 p.m., and Christy was at the store minutes later as it was located only a few streets over from her house. It's reported that the young girl had left her home in a turquoise bathing suit with no shoes on her feet. I swear, if this guy gets charged and convicted of this one, give him the needle. But keep going. Now, based on what's been reported, it does appear as though Christy made her way to the grocery store and did purchase the cat food she intended to buy there. However, the timeline of events after she arrived at the grocery store are a little fuzzy, and authorities have had a hard time nailing down exactly what happened after she bought this cat food. It's been stated that she may have either stayed at the store for a few hours past her 3 p.m. arrival until about 6 p.m. to play on the video games in the store. And if that's not exactly what took place, it's also believed that she could have left the Green Acres grocery store and went to play at a park that was just around the corner. One would expect that even if she had stayed out for a little while to hang out with friends or play these video games or whatever, she most likely would have been home before dark. I mean, she was only eight years old. And she had no shoes on and a bathing suit. Yeah, exactly. So you would expect that she's going to plan to go home. I mean, I know it's Florida in the end of May, but still. I don't remember how I was when I was eight years old. Maybe I would just hang out in swimming trunks or something. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) But to think you get sent on this errand, you're just wearing a bathing suit and no shoes. Yeah. Well, I think she made the decision. I think Christy was like, I'm going to get food for my cats. Oh, she wasn't sent there on an errand? No, it seems like she wanted to do it herself. She had these two cats, and it's funny because they always talk about um, the names of the cats. I got to tell you it. It's funny. Boo Boo and Skeeter. I wonder who named those. <laughs> Probably her. <laughs> <laughs> it's reported that her sister noticed that she still wasn't home at around 8.30 that night. And then she woke her mom up around 9 p.m. to alert her of her sister's absence. Immediately, her mom called the police. Christy Luna had been last seen hours ago at this point, at least by her mother and sister, and authorities in Florida were all over this case just as quickly as police were all over Tammy's up in New Hampshire later that year. They wasted no time as soon as they were alerted of the young girl's disappearance, and a search party was put together that same night. It's reported that at some point, and I believe that it's during this initial search, that searchers found her turquoise bathing suit that she'd been last seen wearing in what's been described as a, quote, swampy wooded area near their home. So obviously the instant panic that set in for the family must have been insane. Where could Christy have gone and why were her clothes being found in the woods near her house? From the very start, authorities had their work cut out for them as it appears as though there were a lot of bad dudes, including that of Victor Winetti, living in and around the Green Acres area. Florida man. For real though, There have been several suspects that were looked into in regards to Christie's disappearance. The first two suspects in the case are Willis and Charles Rambo, who were brothers that were living together and their home was very close to Christie's. Apparently, these degenerates thought it was a great idea to make friends with prepubescent girls and Christie and her friends had even been over to their place a few times before. After finding that out, I am sure these two men flew to the top of the suspect list. Not only that, But after authorities interviewed one of Christie's friends regarding their whole investigation, they discovered that this friend, who was only six years old at the time, was being molested by the Rambo brothers. Authorities had what they needed at this point and immediately searched the Rambo home, but were unable to find anything to connect them to Christie's disappearance. Regardless of the fact that she'd been there before and these two men were allegedly sexually assaulting her friend, there was nothing police could find to point towards these brothers having anything to do with what happened to Christy. Now, thankfully, these two men were charged in the abuse case against this friend of Christie's, and both men would plead guilty to those charges. Apparently, they only received 10 years probation for their vile behavior, though, which I find to be a rather pathetic sentence, especially considering this is Florida, and I feel like they tend to hand down some pretty hefty sentences in Florida. Is Florida a three-strike state? 
That I'm not sure about. I'm going to look it up. So, yes, this is based on, um, let's see, I'm going to butcher this name, but it's mm -hmm. um, valcarcellaw.com. Okay. Dot com, and it says, according to Florida statutes, the three-strike law leads to elevated penalties for those who have committed three or more violent felonies in Florida. Mm. This law applies to felony offenders. It can feel like three strikes, you're out. Well, it should. By fucking three felonies, it should be three strikes, you're out. Yeah, but... At but least with Victor, because his other stuff was up in New Hampshire. Sure. But let me just continue here. Florida's three strikes law is used to impose maximum prison sentences to individuals convicted of their third violent felony. The goal is to prevent habitual offenders from committing additional serious crimes as a third strike. Offenses that qualify as violent felonies and can, therefore, be listed as a strike include, but are not limited to, murder, rape, Voluntary manslaughter, kidnapping, carjacking, and robbery. Interesting. So these two brothers clearly didn't get charged with a felony to only get 10 years probation. So what the hell did they get charged Unless with? Unless it was a plea deal, because they pled guilty. I don't know. So who knows? But There should be no plea deals for child molesters. There should be no good behavior for child molesters. I'm not going to say what I want to say <laughs> for child molesters, <laughs> but you all get what I'm saying. I think everybody listening agrees. Not only were these guys on probation for the sexual abuse of this six-year-old girl, but Willis, one of the brothers, would actually go on to be charged and convicted for abusing his stepdaughter as well. So that just goes into this whole three-strike thing. Like, why? Right. But if that first one wasn't a felony, if they got a plea deal or whatever, True. this might only be a first strike. So sure, three strikes is great, but if you're not getting charged with a violent felony, then it doesn't fucking matter. Mm -hmm. I think we can assume we've kind of come to the same conclusion to say, like, these guys seem likely in this case but unfortunately they found no evidence they found nothing to say even though they're doing this horrible thing to her friend and one of the brothers has allegedly abused his stepdaughter even with all of that these guys don't get charged in christie's case well it makes me think about last week's episode with lloyd lee welch and fred coffee yep where those were two shady dudes mm -hmm. in the area that had committed crimes that were similar to or would go on to commit crimes that are similar to what happened with kathy Beatty. yeah but nothing ended up getting linked there. Mm -hmm. And it was just a coincidence that there were bad dudes in the area at the time that this other crime occurred. Yeah, so that's what this feels like. For months, Palm Beach County PD, which is the investigating agency on Christie's case, worked all the leads they received in her missing persons case and worked their way through the long list of suspects that would emerge. However, Victor Winetti wouldn't come onto Palm Beach County PD's radar until after Tammy disappeared. Once investigators in New Hampshire had their sights set on Victor, they found that his car was registered in Florida and began calling local authorities down there. Once Palm Beach County PD heard from Exeter PD, that's when the connections became visible and authorities began to look into Victor's potential involvement in Christie's disappearance. Mm -hmm. So it's discovered that on the day Christie went missing, Victor Winetti was seen outside the grocery store where she had been that afternoon. And not only that... But apparently, he'd also been seen at a party near the area that same day as well. In an article with the Palm Beach Post, it stated, quote, When Eddie went to church that morning with his parents, and according to police, was at a party that afternoon in Luna's neighborhood. Someone fitting his description was seen outside the store, police said, end quote. How long after his release did this crime take place? So he was released, I believe, towards the end of 1983. He moved to Florida in March of 1984, and then Christy went missing at the end of May in 1984. So I don't know where you're going to go with this. I don't know if he's mm -hmm. going to get charged and convicted on this. But if you think about it, you had his prior that he was charged and gets convicted on that. Then he's in jail for however many years, gets out on good behavior, mm -hmm. which is bullshit. <laughs> so now he's been away, hasn't been able to do the shit that he usually does, yep. moves down to Florida, now, maybe he's trying to be the reformed man mm. from prison, mm -hmm. but sees this young girl walking in a fucking bathing suit, no shoes on, mm -hmm. and where he didn't kill his stepdaughter, he now has all this pent up sexual frustration, mm -hmm. goes after this girl, maybe ends up killing her because her bathing suit was found. Yeah. She's probably dead. Yes. That's what I would assume. The thing that stood out to me is that he went to church that morning. Yeah. Probably to try and confess his sins. Exactly. It's like, really? Really? So the proximity of all these locations that he's seen at and the ones that Christy was seen at are all so close together that whether she was at the grocery store like 
investigators believed until maybe 6 p.m. or even if she was at the park, Victor was around and he would have had access from really any of the places he was seen that afternoon. But then, several months after Christy went missing in late May of 1984, Victor just up and moved out of the Florida area in early November of that same year. And where did he move to? New Hampshire. Bingo. Now, after Victor moved back to the New Hampshire area, he secured employment at an auto body shop known as Brad's Custom Auto Body, which was located on Main Street in Exeter. Which, if you're curious and already trying to make some connections here... On the path to the school. Yeah, the shop was literally 0.3 miles, or less than a one-minute drive down the street from where Tammy Belanger was last seen walking to school. Mm Mm-hmm. Doesn't surprise me. You can give me little bits and pieces of information now, and I can probably connect the dots. Okay, so let's dive into something that's a little more strange about the whole proximity thing. How about the fact that Victor Winetti did not have an alibi for the day in question? Apparently, he called out sick that day. Yeah, he was probably on his way to work. Saw her walking to school. What time is he supposed to be at work? 7 a.m. I had it written down. So she was on her way to school. Mm -hmm. What time did she leave to go to school? She was last seen at 8 a.m. He was supposed to be at work at 7, but he never showed. And you know when he called? When he called in sick? Noon. Exactly. Maybe he was on a bender the night before. Starts to go into work late. Sees Tammy Mm -hmm. walking to school. Does whatever there. And then is like, oh, I got to call out sick. Well, get this. His boss told the Palm Beach Post, quote, He didn't miss a day of work until the day of that incident, end quote. Yeah, what are the odds? We talk about coincidences and shit like that, but, I mean, come on. I completely agree. I have nothing else to say other than it's sus. It's super sus. Right. Who knows what's going to happen in Florida, Mm -hmm. if you have any more information on that. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he never misses a day of work, and then he's supposed to be there at 7 o'clock, she's walking to school at Mm -hmm. 8 o'clock, Maybe he was on his way in late. Yep. And then she goes missing and he doesn't call out for four hours after she was last seen. Yep. It just all, it all makes sense. It's reported that the police and the FBI were made aware of Victor pretty early on after Tammy went missing. And the FBI actually interviewed him just six days after she initially disappeared. And that interview took place on November 19th, 1984. But from what I can tell... Not much came of that discussion. But regardless of if anything came out of this interview, I think, based on everything else we know so far, Victor Winetti is looking pretty suspicious. So suspicious, in fact, that apparently a grand jury was convened in December of 1984, the same month authorities considered Victor to be a suspect in Tammy's disappearance. I was literally going to say before you said that last bit, if he's not a suspect by now, he's definitely a person of interest. Absolutely. But yeah, clearly, grand jury's ready to fucking put it to him. Well, according to an article in the Boston Globe, quote, a secret grand jury was presented with evidence, but an assistant attorney general said at that time that an indictment was not sought. The purpose of the review was to help further the investigation, end quote. What the hell does that mean? That's an excellent question. I don't know. I've never heard of convening a grand jury to not expect an indictment. I could see if they convened a grand jury to see what their feeling was, to gauge the general Mm. public's feelings towards the case, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Like, hey, if we did charge him, what are the odds that somebody's going to want to convict him or that a jury's going to want to convict him? Mm, True. That's very true. Maybe that's what that means by the purpose of the review being to help further the investigation. So, like, did authorities have to say, okay, they don't like what we've got. We got to get more. I guess. I'd have to ask somebody. Yeah. Yeah. That would be in the know about that, because I don't know why you convene a grand jury to further an investigation outside of gauging the odds of a jury convicting or being willing to look at the case. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's unfortunate that he wasn't indicted this early on in the investigation, but that doesn't mean that he would be let off the hook and police wouldn't continue to look into him. Now, we already talked a little bit about Victor's prior conviction of abusing his stepdaughter and... If we're trying to work with a timeline, it's all matching up. If he was sentenced in 1979 and then served four years, that means he would have been out in 1983. He then left the area, moved down to Florida, and then in late May of 1984, Christy goes missing. Then, early November, Victor moves back up to New Hampshire, and less than two weeks later, Tammy Belanger goes missing. He was in both areas at both times. 
and he has no alibi for Tammy's case. Exactly. As time goes on, it appears as though Victor would actually decide to leave the New Hampshire area again, this time in January of 1991, to go back to... Florida. Yes. Mommy's house. (laughs) Yep. I mean, he can't stay away from either place, can he? I don't know, but this guy has clearly had way too many chances. He's gotten fucking lucky at every turn that I'm hoping the hammer drops. Let's keep going. At this point, at least in 1991 multiple agencies were on to him. Authorities in Florida seemed to be particularly interested in him, whether that be for a string of burglaries he might have been involved in, Christie's disappearance, or both. Regardless of why they're on to him, apparently he was put under surveillance. It's reported that sometime during 1991, Victor was under 24-7 surveillance for three weeks, and authorities were watching his every move. An article with Foster's Daily Democrat stated, quote, He always thought he was smarter than everyone else. The lawyers, the FBI, the profilers who were brought in. His car was set up to be a sex offender car, so the back doors wouldn't open from the inside after he pushed her into the back seat, end quote. Who were they referring to there? I think maybe they were using the term her as in like his attraction to young girls, not like anyone in particular, but they were just using that as an example of like, this is why his car is set up this way. And it's not a particular girl they're talking about. Right. He probably thought that he was smarter than everybody else because he kept getting a fucking break. And think of how many things he got away with. Probably way too many, but he really wasn't nearly as smart as he thought he was. Because apparently, at some point, authorities caught him, yet again, being a pervert. He'd been seen peering into young girls' bedroom windows in West Palm Beach, Florida. And I kid you not, authorities had him on videotape doing it. It's reported that Victor was finally arrested after he was caught returning to these girls' homes upwards of 14 times in less than three weeks. And not only that, the guy was caught, while being videotaped, mind you, masturbating outside of their windows. Why would they let him do this 14 times before they fucking grab him? I don't know how many of those times he was actually under surveillance because they said he went back that many times in a three-week span of time. So Mm -hmm. you have to think that's probably at least like every other night, maybe even more than that because... There's 21 days in three weeks, but you probably have at least a handful of times of him doing this. Also on video. Yes, I guess if they're trying to build a case and there's no physical threat to these individuals that he's peeping. Yeah, yeah. But that's still like an invasion of privacy. You know this is going on. You know, like think if you were the parents and you knew that the cops were watching this guy peer into your daughter's fucking room. Mm -hmm. I'd want to beat everybody involved. Absolutely. It's like, oh, you want to build your case, but you're going to let this guy look at my fucking daughter as she's undressing in her bedroom or something Mm -hmm. like that. Pretty shitty either way. But at least he's finally caught. Hopefully he gets what's coming to him. Mm -hmm. Continue on. So this arrest takes place in June of 1991, which is five months after he'd moved back down to Florida. He was arrested for indecent exposure as well as burglary, and he spent his time awaiting trial incarcerated. Well, there's a felony. Which one? Burglary. Indecent exposure is a misdemeanor? Yeah. Okay. And a lot of times people misconstrue indecent exposure. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's totally accurate. Yes. But like people think that if you're peeing on the side of the road, you can get charged with that stuff. Yeah. Maybe it differs from state to state, but there needs to be some type of sexual gratification attached to that. Oh, okay. So peeing in public might be a charge, but you're not going to get charged with indecent exposure because somebody walked by while you were peeing outside. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. So yeah, because he was doing this looking for sexual gratification, Mm -hmm. that's why he ended up getting charged with that. But the burglary should be a felony charge. Okay. Well, what I'm about to tell you now I think is probably going to make you very happy. Victor was later found guilty for these crimes that he was charged with, and the judge sentenced him to 75 years in prison. Good fucking riddance. Even though... Oh, but on good behavior, he got out in five months. (laughs) No. Even though, Victor seemed to think that his one year served while he was awaiting trial was good enough. But the presiding judge thought otherwise. Oh, yeah, no shit. An article with the South Florida Sun Sentinel stated, quote, What he did not say was that he was sorry, and for that, he received the 75-year sentence. The one thing I did not hear any scintilla of reference to is remorse and sorrow on your part for the emotional upheaval and pain you caused these two families, Circuit Judge Walter Colbath Jr. told Winetti. Because of his lack of remorse and his 23 prior convictions that included aggravated sexual battery of his stepdaughter, 
Colbath decided Winetti was a continuing danger to society and gave him a harsher sentence under the habitual offender provision, end quote. Damn fucking straight. Yeah. That's the thing, like, habitual offenders, I get it where if, like, one serious crime happens and there is, like, a whole shroud of, you know, oh, I didn't mean to do it, it didn't happen, like, murder versus manslaughter and stuff like that. Yeah. Sometimes people get sentenced to way harsher sentences than... They, they technically necessarily, should be, yeah. Right, than they necessarily deserve. But when you have 23 prior convictions and this guy's still out, thank God for this judge to finally have some fucking balls. Walter Colbath Jr., man. And throw the book at this guy. Absolutely. Because how many judges before him could have done the same thing? Mm-hmm, I Does totally it take agree. 23 convictions to become a habitual offender? Or could somebody have done that when they saw 17? Or 12? Or five? Or five? Yeah. It's insane. Get me fired up over here. <laughs> what comes out later that we learn happened sometime while Victor was locked up for that year-long period waiting for his trial was that several of his fellow inmates came forward to tell authorities that he'd admitted to them that he raped and killed Tammy Belanger and Christy Luna. Yep. This guy's a total narcissist. Oh, 100%. Like when they were saying, oh, he thinks he's smarter than everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know that he's going to go in there and he's going to fucking brag about it. Mm -hmm. But I find it strange that he's bragging about it in prison because from what I know and from what I've heard, Mm -hmm. people like him in prison get fucking destroyd. Yeah, for for the crimes they've committed. Or things like that. Yeah. Right. So I don't know. I mean, maybe he thought he wasn't going to be in jail for that long. Like he thought, oh, I thought my one year in jail was sufficient. Like maybe he thought he was just going to get out. Well, he had gotten easy sentences every other time before. Yeah. So maybe he just thought he was going to get lucky again. And thankfully, this judge was like, uh uh, buddy, you're done. I think it's pretty clear that Victor had a sick obsession with young girls, and it was reported that he had a, quote, fetish for girls between the ages of 8 and 10 years old. Christy and Tammy were both 8 at the time of their disappearances, and his stepdaughter was 8 years old when he first started abusing her. Lee Kant, who's a retired chief investigator with the Department of Corrections, stated, quote, the circumstantial evidence against him was overwhelming, end quote. And while I was researching, I did find one piece of circumstantial evidence that I think is a pretty big deal regarding his potential involvement in Tammy's disappearance specifically. I initially only saw it mentioned on the Charlie Project's write-up on Tammy's case, but as I dug deeper, I found that in-depth article with the Palm Beach Post that covered Victor Winetti. And in this article, it stated, quote, After three weeks of surveillance, detectives arrested Winetti on June 4th on a string of peeping Tom burglary charges. When they searched the house he shared with his mother, they found a scrapbook of pictures he had cut out and saved. Among them was a published photo of Tammy Belanger, one of the missing girls Winetti said he never knew, end quote. Yeah, right. Do you see that as a trophy? Because it's a published photo of her, so it's after the fact. I do. I think trophy is a fair term for it. Yeah, you don't know what happened, what he did, what he did not do, if he's involved at all, even though I think we believe he is. Maybe he didn't take anything, and now after the fact, he's like... I need something to remind me of what I did. Yeah, I agree. What kind of throws me off a little bit is Tammy hasn't been found, it doesn't seem like. Mm -hmm. None of her belongings have been found, it doesn't seem like. Mm -hmm. But Christy's bathing suit was found. But her body never was. But her body never was. It's weird. It is weird. It's So uh, I was just thinking from the trophy aspect of it. Oh, yeah. Well, she wouldn't have had anything else on her either. Like we know, maybe he took the cat food. Maybe he ate the cat food. I could could picture somebody (laughs) fucked up like that. Going home and fucking eating the cat food. I It's super fucked up, but I completely agree. Yeah. But with the whole trophy thing, like maybe he wanted to discard any evidence Mm -hmm. that could tie him to these girls. Yeah. But by taking the cutout out of a newspaper, it's not like having a personal belonging to this girl that went missing. Right. And he could be like, oh, I followed her case. I thought it was so horrible. I kept her picture. I was living in the area at the time and I mm-hmm. was just so heartbroken about what happened. Even though it's more than likely the opposite. Right. But that's not the only piece of potential circumstantial evidence. His car had allegedly been seen in the area on the same day both girls went missing. We obviously already knew about him being seen nearby in Christie's case, but now we know that his car was seen nearby and that just continues to solidify for me that he's somehow involved and especially because what we were just talking about with the car yes i totally believe he's involved Mm -hmm. there's more than enough evidence where if you put it in front of a jury obviously this grand jury was already convened Mm 
mm-hmm. and they're like ready to fucking go after this guy. Mm-hmm. But you put all this stuff in front of somebody, like beyond a reasonable doubt, mm-hmm. even without hard physical evidence, like DNA stuff tying him yeah. to her. The guy's got no alibi. He's tied to all these other things. He's a habitual offender. He's clearly involved one way or the other. Yeah, and- but it's circumstantial. Like, do you think that it's like one of those things? I think we talked about this in Julianne Miller's case where you didn't have a body. And it's the same thing here. You don't have a body and everything that you have is circumstantial. Well, that's why How I said, are you going to go forward with charges if you are worried it's not a slam dunk? Well, that's why I'm wondering if the AG said, oh, we convened that grand jury to further the investigation because they knew that all they had was circumstantial evidence and mm. they wanted to further it and they were feeling it out. That makes They were ready sense. to go forward, but they knew exactly what you were just saying. There's no body. There's no hard physical evidence. I mean, sure, you can say that the picture is circumstantial evidence, but he fucking denied knowing Tammy Belanger. He was seen in the area, didn't have an alibi, didn't show up to work, and then he has a picture of her at his mother's house in Florida, and he denied ever knowing her. Yeah. It's, That's not circumstantial to me. That's fucking hard evidence. I agree completely with you. I don't want anybody to think that I don't. I'm just trying to play devil's advocate and here to see how other people could interpret it. Like, even that chief was saying it's circumstantial, it's overwhelming, but it's just circumstantial. So they might not think that that's like, I can get this guy for it. I don't agree. You have overwhelming circumstantial evidence. There is a threshold of when there is so much Mm -hmm. that it practically becomes some type of hard physical evidence. Not to mention, you now have people coming forward with fucking statements from prison saying that he admitted to it. Yeah. You now have overwhelming circumstantial evidence all this guy's prior convictions and people that he was cellmates with or knew in prison coming forward saying that he confessed to it. Well, maybe they looked into these inmates. Maybe they weren't reliable. I don't care. I understand. I am fully of that mindset. I'm just thinking because obviously I know at hey. this point there's no charges. What is the reason for that? Like, I want to know the behind the scenes, like what's going on with authorities for them to say, why aren't we charging this guy? I think this guy should have been charged however long back in the script ago. This should have been done a long fucking time ago and there never should have been anything else that we've talked about. But why are we here right now? And why are we still talking about why he still hasn't been charged? That's what I want to know. Well, I'm going to go back to what our dear friend Drew had said. Ah, yes. It's not the police. The police can arrest somebody and they can charge somebody. Mm -hmm. But it's the town or city solicitor it's the ag Mm. it's all these other people that need to go forward with those charges and try the case yeah and if there's political pressure if they're like oh it's not a slam dunk like we were just saying that was kathy linglotti that they said that exactly and they don't want to fucking tarnish their perfect conviction record yeah because they have aspirations of moving up the political ladder yep maybe that's why and they're saying He's already in there for 75 years. Who cares if we get a conviction on this one? The guy's never getting out. You know, who cares? Her fucking family cares. I'm not saying that they don't. And I totally agree with you. Anybody that's committed a crime that there is a good chance that they can get charged and convicted for it. Mm -hmm. They should have to have their day in court and let the people decide. It doesn't matter that he's going to be in jail forever because there are other people that have been affected by these terrible acts that he's committed. Yeah. That want their own closure. It's not closure to her family to know that he's in prison for 75 years for other crimes. Yeah, they don't care about that. They say, I want him to have another fucking 75 years for Right, I want to be in that courtroom and I want to be looking at his face while the judge throws a book at him and Mm -hmm. I want to say, good, finally we have some closure for what happened to our daughter, if he were to be convicted. Yes, well, as we're fired up here and we obviously know there's a ton of circumstantial but overwhelming circumstantial evidence and a lot of things that seem very incriminating towards Victor, there's actually more. And there's more. (laughs) Yep. In that article I mentioned from the Palm Beach Post that did that in-depth rundown on Victor, there were a few tidbits of information that really seemed to strengthen my belief that Winetti was involved. One being that Victor's fellow employees and even his boss mentioned that he was acting super weird the days following Tammy's disappearance. The owner of the business Victor worked for stated, quote, The day after the girl disappeared, he was in a world of his own. At lunch, he just stood by himself, rubbing his key against the hood of a car, end quote. Not only that, but Victor had also acted very strange with the motel owner of the place he'd been living at at the time, particularly after he'd been questioned by the FBI. Apparently, he asked her to lie for him and say that his car had been in the parking lot that entire 
morning. Victor had even told others that he knew how to get rid of a body. Which then makes me think, because Christy and Tammy's bodies have never been found, is that true? Could be. That's just messed up. I would have to assume that it is, because based on everything put forward, we believe that he's involved in both of these. And I hate to beat a dead horse, but to go back to if this guy was put on trial for these cases, Mm -hmm. look at all the people that they could bring in to testify that this guy is shady, that he was acting weird, that he asked them to lie, Mm -hmm. that he came to them and said that he knew how to get rid of a body. Mm -hmm. Who is he going to have testify in his defense? Mom, maybe? Mom was in Florida. She wasn't in New Hampshire. She had no shit. At least for Tammy's case, yeah, but... Well, that's the one that we're discussing today. I know that all these other ones are involved, but, you know? Well, even though Victor seems to be the most likely and really the only person that probably committed both of these crimes... Not all members of the police departments who've worked on both cases will come right out and say, yeah, Victor's the guy. Why do you have the face? I'm just wondering who would think otherwise or what do they have to make them think otherwise? Well, no, I think it's more along the lines of they don't want to say publicly Victor Winetti did this without either physical evidence or, I mean, they know that they didn't get an indictment. Maybe they are just treading lightly and not saying to the press, I think this guy did it, rather than just like beating around the bush. I get that. I mean, we're not saying anything definitive here either. No. But based on the evidence put forward, you can make an educated guess. Well, yeah. And what I will say is that in every article I've seen where there's an interview with either a current or a retired detective that worked on either of these cases, they just give like more and more information that kind of alludes to them still believing that at the end of the day, even though they don't come right out and say it word for word. I get that. And when you're in that type of position, you shouldn't come forward and make those types of claims. But when we are looking at this, you know, nearly 40 years later, and we have all this information put in front of us, while we're just shooting the shit, you could say, yeah, I mean, overwhelming circumstantial evidence, all these people that could testify to how shady he was, no alibi, all these prior convictions, yeah, I'm sure if you talk Nobody to these else... guys candidly, they'd be like, yeah, I did it. Right, but, you right. know, it's different when you're talking to the press and you have yeah, a public statement going out there and you're representing a police department. I get that. Yep, totally agree. In the interview Jim Valaket did with the Foster's Daily Democrat, he stated, quote, We were never able to discover what happened. There was no absolute evidence. Even hair fiber right now would be so much more drastic information, end quote. The Exeter police chief back when Tammy first disappeared told the Boston Globe on the one-year anniversary of the young girl's disappearance, quote, It's frustrating when you put together 11 books of evidence and you come up with nothing. At this point, nothing. Usually, when you have a crime, you have a crime scene. You have physical evidence. We don't. We're working out of thin air, end quote. Yeah, I mean, I get what that chief was saying. If you had hair fiber, if you had anything, if you had any physical evidence, it would be dramatically better than what you have now because you really don't have any physical evidence. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, if Victor was involved mm-hmm. and he had these locks on the back of his door and the girl couldn't get out. Yeah. But I'm thinking like, yeah, they surveilled this guy. They had all this stuff. Like, I assume they probably went through his car and looked for all this shit and there was probably nothing. I so, would assume so, but I never saw anything reported about that. So he, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, if both Florida and New Hampshire did their due diligence on the investigation, I assume once they had the ability to mm. arrest him, search his car, search his property, shit like that, I'm sure they did that. I don't think they would drop the ball on that. So if they couldn't come up with anything, Mm -hmm. maybe this guy was an idiot savant and all he could really do was get rid of bodies and clean the cars and stuff. Well, then you have to think about it too because that matches up even if you're thinking about when Tammy was last seen and then when Victor called out sick at work. So there was four hours there. There's time there to clean a car. Four hours between the call. Yes, exactly. He could have had however much time. He could have been fucking eight hours out of state, out of the country, wherever, Mm -hmm. and then had all that time after the fact because he wasn't seen until the next day at work. Yeah, it's crazy. But unfortunately, due to the lack of physical evidence and because they haven't been able to nail down exactly what happened to Tammy that day in November, investigators were never able to bring charges against Victor Winetti, regardless of how good all this circumstantial evidence has been. While authorities did all they could over the years to try and connect Victor to not only Tammy's disappearance, but also Christie's, nothing ever panned out. For either. Either. But as the years went on, tips and leads did come in and authorities took them all seriously. In January of 1986, about a year and a half after Tammy had disappeared, 
authorities drained a pond known as Badger's Ice Pond. It's unclear exactly what prompted them to do so, but they likely received a tip and were hoping to find any evidence there. But unfortunately, just like with all previous leads, they came up empty. Then, after nearly a decade, in 1994, it's reported that authorities received a credible tip, this time in regards to a cemetery. Apparently, this tip had come in stating that Tammy had been buried in an already existing grave, in a cemetery somewhere in Exeter, New Hampshire. The woman that was buried in this grave had been there since 1984, the same year Tammy went missing. Investigators went on to dig up this woman's grave, but were met with disappointment yet again. The only body found in the grave was the one of the 91-year-old woman originally buried there. And if you're wondering, based on an article in the Bennington Banner, it was looked into and there were no connections made between Tammy and this woman that was buried in the cemetery. I'm just thinking, the way to hide a body. Yeah, absolutely. You do it in a grave, especially one if it was dug in. Recently. Recently. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be so easily determined that it was disturbed because somebody had just been buried there, so... Yeah. It's not like somebody walking by would be like, did somebody just dig this up? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thing. I think that's probably why it seemed a little more likely because she right. was buried the same year that Tammy went missing. Mm -hmm. So that seems pretty credible. I can understand why they would yeah. go to the extent of, I'm going to dig this up and I'm going to check. I agree, yeah. At the end of the day, Victor seems to be the number one suspect. And even though he's previously said things like, quote, what they should say is that for seven years, they've tried to make me a suspect, but they can't, end quote. I think everyone can agree that that statement is probably him just trying to hide his responsibility. Thankfully, though, even though he's never been definitively tied to either case, that monster is no longer alive to be able to harm any other children. Victor Winetti died shortly after he was released from prison in 2012. Say that again? What? That last sentence. Say that again. Victor Winetti died shortly after he was released from prison in 2012. I thought he was... Sentenced to 75 years. He somehow got out, babe. 20 years of a 75-year sentence for a habitual offender that had been convicted on 23 previous counts. Hey, I don't control the judicial system. I don't know what to tell you. It's fucked up. I get it. And then you have people that are sitting in prison for life sentences for fucking weed. Yes. And shit like that. It's messed non -violent up. Nonviolent crimes. It's absolutely messed up. And thank God he died like months later and couldn't do anything else. But he should have died in prison. He should have. Tammy's mother had been interviewed by the union leader, and when the subject came up regarding Victor's death, there's a passage that describes her feelings on the matter. It stated, quote, I'm glad he's gone. He won't be able to take other children. Asked whether she believes when Eddie took her little girl, she said, I just have to go on what the police have said, and they seem to think that he's the one that did do this, end quote. What happened to Tammy is horrible, and the fact that her family has lived for decades without answers is just cruel. But there was at least some semblance of good that came out of such a terrible tragedy. I mentioned earlier on in the episode about how schools at the time didn't have anything implemented regarding student absences. Well, that certainly changed after Tammy disappeared. A new system was implemented in local New Hampshire schools to ensure that parents would get a call to check on children who didn't arrive to school that day. Parents were also urged to call the school to alert them of their child's absence to avoid getting that call if they didn't show up. Not only that, but there was an article in the Burlington Free Press in January of 1985, which was just three months after Tammy had disappeared, explaining their new implementation of a statewide telephone alert system for abducted and missing children in the state of Vermont. It was essentially like an early Amber Alert system, but they would even go as far as to, quote, seal off the state in these types of situations. The director of this new program told the Burlington Free Press, quote, we're throwing a security blanket on Vermont. It will also discourage people from messing around with our kids, end quote. And yes, I know, Vermont is the state over, and no, it wasn't implemented in New Hampshire, at least not at this point. But hey, it's certainly a start, and Tammy's case was actually mentioned in this particular article as an example of why a program like this was needed. It appears as though Tammy's disappearance is one of those cases that set a precedent for future situations like it. Not only was this new program initiated in Vermont, but New Hampshire had also been pushing for harsher prison sentences for convicted child molesters. And yet again, Tammy's case was used as an example and a reason why this legislature should be passed. I think you agree with all of this so far, don't you? I do. You were I'm fired just... up and now you're not saying anything. <laughs> no, I mean, you get to the point where it's like, the guy's fucking dead. He got out early. 
I've already said my piece on mm -hmm. it. The guy should have been in prison for the rest of his life. He should have died in prison. And we're all hyped about how this judge was like, oh, you're getting 75 years. You're a habitual offender, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. And he gets out in fucking 20. He didn't even do half the sentence. Yeah, but I bet that's not, it's obviously not that judge's choice. I get that, that it but happened, it's, but, but it happened. Yes, I agree. If but it was I that think... judge's choice, he probably would have did the 75 years total. Yeah, but I think the good thing here, and it sucks to say like this is a good thing, like it's not, all of it just sucks, but at least you see Vermont, Vermont saw this and they say, this is messed up. This case is an example of why we need this system. Right, New Hampshire schools, this is why we need to implement the phone calls. New Hampshire legislature, these piece of crap child molesters should be in prison for so much longer. Like at least it's firing other people up to say, Changes need to be made. Exactly. It's like the light in the dark where, yes, all this terrible stuff happened, but if we can take anything good out of it and hopefully make it so something like this is less likely to happen going forward. Yeah. The best we can do is learn from our mistakes. Yes. And like that guy said, it's telling you to not mess with our kids. Damn straight. Today, Tammy's case is still open and active, but it has since been transferred over to the state attorney general's cold case unit. It's been reported that authorities are still receiving tips and continue to work them to hopefully bring some semblance of closure or even just answers to the Belanger family. There aren't really any other theories in this case outside of Victor Winetti being involved. And I think just based on our conversation, you can all tell the conclusion we've come to here. But without ever knowing what happened to her or finding her remains, there might never be a definitive answer. But the thing that I get hung up on is how is it that this individual was able to abduct and potentially murder a young girl nearly four decades ago and no one has ever been able to find her remains or literally any indication of any kind of where she might be? If Victor is the one responsible, he wasn't the brightest criminal. So then how could he have committed a potential murder and hide it so well that no one would ever find her remains? And that brings me back to what that psychic said. Could her saying that she was incinerated hold any merit? I think it could. And to even further the idea of how did he get away with it for so long? How did nobody know about it? He was bragging about it in prison. Mm -hmm. If he was bragging about it in prison, you know he was telling people elsewhere. Somebody has to know something. And if this guy was such a fucking loser, he could have told people and people could have just written it off and not really paid attention to him and been like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm not listening to you mm -hmm. or I don't care about what you're saying. So there could very well be people that could come out with some type of statement or just a tip or whatever. Hey, this crazy guy, I don't know if it was this Victor guy, but I remember I lived in New Hampshire. I lived in Florida mm -hmm. during this time that he was around there and somebody made a mention of this. Mm -hmm. And you could just give that little tip yes, to somebody and it could unravel this whole mystery of both Christy and Tammy. Yeah, it's like you saw what I had written here before you started speaking, because that's exactly what I was going to say next was there's no way he kept this all in. No, no there possible is, way. There is no way he had to have told somebody mm -hmm. if he told these inmates who he didn't know. I bet you he told his best friend, Joe Schmo probably did tell Joe Schmo. Exactly. So there's got to be more there that people can come forward. And the thing that I think like really sticks out to me and gets me really fired up in this case is the fact that, yes, Tammy went missing all these years ago and her remains have never been found. Yes, Victor went to jail. Yes, he is dead. But that does not mean that her family doesn't deserve answers now, that they don't deserve to know where she is, that they don't deserve to put her to rest properly. That is exactly what the Belanger family deserves. And if anybody knows anything, that's why you need to come forward. It's not for prosecution. It's not to say, oh, definitively, Victor did this. It's find the girl. Just find her. So if you knew Victor Winetti back in 1984, did he ever tell you anything that might have made you think twice? And if you didn't know him, but were living in the Exeter, New Hampshire area back then, did you see something? Did you notice Victor's car? It's been reported that he drove a blue 1975 Oldsmobile sedan with a broken tail light. That's a pretty distinctive car. So, do you remember seeing a vehicle matching this description on or near Lincoln Street in November of 1984? Do you remember seeing a man speaking with a young girl? These are all important questions to ask, and even the tiniest tidbit that someone might remember from that day or time frame in question could mean something. If you know anything, 
or have any information regarding the disappearance of Tammy Belanger, please contact the Exeter Police Department at 603-772-1212 or the New Hampshire Department of Justice Cold Case Unit at 603-271-2663. Thank you all so much for tuning in every week. We're so happy to have you here. Make sure to leave us a five-star review before you go and follow us on our socials. You can follow us on Instagram at wicked.deeds.podcast and on Twitter at Wicked Deeds. Don't forget to visit our website, wickeddeedspodcast.com, to take a look at any photos from this episode and view our source material. But most importantly, tune in next week for an all-new episode. <laughs>